Hello friends, good morning and welcome to Park Boulevard Presbyterian Church. Today is Sunday, September 13th, and we are continuing on into week two of our new sermon series called The Unstoppable Force, where we're working our way through the book of Acts. Today we'll be in Acts chapter two. Back when I was in college, I had the opportunity to spend a couple of summers in Eastern Europe on short-term mission trips. We had expected, my team and I, to be operating under the radar since at that time those countries were still in the communist era and overt evangelism had not yet been allowed. But the year was 1989 and things were changing, changing dramatically. The wall in Germany came down that year and the Eastern Bloc countries were opening up and allowing new freedoms. I was in Poland with my group and we found ourselves suddenly able to preach openly on street corners and in the parks. The interesting thing about this was that people actually stopped and listened to what we had to say. We would often have people's attention for 20 or even 30 minutes at a time, whereas in the U.S. we might have had people's attention for two minutes if they stopped at all. All we had to do was set up an easel with a pad of paper and start drawing a picture on it, or somebody pulled out their guitar and started playing it, and we would start to gather a crowd. Of course, since then, as time has gone by and there are more things competing for people's attention, people's attention spans have gone down, gotten much shorter, and it just becomes more and more challenging to get somebody's attention, just as it is here in the United States. Well, I don't know what the average attention span was for people staying in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, but in Acts chapter 2, God does something amazing and perfectly suited to capture the attention of a huge group of people who just happened to be present in the city at just the right time. So I'm going to read from the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 24. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Now, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, 
the man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Continuing in verse 36, Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Well, Pentecost was one of the three major Jewish holidays or festivals. Pentecost, the word, means 50th because it took place on the 50th day after Passover. Jews from the diaspora around the Mediterranean world took this as one of their opportunities for pilgrimage, to return to Jerusalem to celebrate and to worship. So we see in this passage that there are what are referred to as devout, God-fearing Jews from every nation, that is the nations all around the Mediterranean world, coming to Jerusalem to be there for this festival right at this moment. This is also 10 days after the ascension of Jesus, which we read about last week in chapter 1. And his disciples, which number around 120, Luke tells us, are all gathered together in one place, probably also to celebrate the festival and to worship together, but also to do what Jesus had told them, which was to be together and to wait until God brought to them what he had for them. So as they're together, all in one place, one large, very large room, suddenly a sound like the rushing wind fills the room, and what appear to be tongues of fire come to rest on each of their heads. And the text tells us that each one is filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak in foreign languages or foreign tongues as the Spirit gives them the ability. Well, this attracts the attention of the passers-by, and a great crowd gathers because Jews from a whole list of different places are suddenly hearing their own native language being spoken. They can tell that this group of people are mostly Galileans, but for some reason, they are suddenly able to speak all of these obscure languages from far-off lands. Now, some of you, hearing this will be from different countries. You no doubt speak English because you're listening to me, but if I were to suddenly be speaking to you in your own original native language or dialect, you would be very surprised. It's not what you need. You can understand me speaking in English, but to hear the message in your own language would take you by surprise, attract your attention, and make you more open, I imagine, to hearing exactly what it was that I had to say to you. Well, this group of people, of these Christ followers, filled with the Holy Spirit, are speaking of God's great deeds. And this group gathers around them, a huge group, which we find out later on, numbering probably in the thousands. For these Jews from various lands, from various corners of the known world, it made them stop and listen and ask the important question, what is going on? Some, however, not surprisingly, just dismiss this as simply a bunch of people who have been drinking. Well, this gives the apostle Peter the opportunity to stand up and to preach to this huge crowd. Remember Peter. This is the same guy who had just recently denied that he even knew Jesus. Obviously, a huge change has come over him, and he's both inspired and empowered to speak to this crowd. And incidentally, this is the first Christian sermon, so I think it's worth us paying attention to. First of all, says Peter, these people who are speaking are not drunk. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Now, you and I know 
that the time of the morning doesn't necessarily keep one from drinking. But Peter's point is that rather than being under the influence of alcohol, these people are under the influence of God's Spirit. Peter goes on to quote a passage from the Old Testament prophet Joel, in which God promises that in the last days, he will pour out his spirit on all people. And this is what is happening now, says Peter. This prophecy is being fulfilled as God's spirit is being poured out in the midst of and upon this group of people. Well, let's ask right here, who or what is this Holy Spirit? Beginning with the creation story in Genesis chapter 1, the Holy Spirit is God's personal presence and power within creation. That's worth saying again. The Holy Spirit is God's personal presence and power within creation. The Spirit of God enters into people, most notably the Old Testament prophets, and enables them to speak and to act for God. You might remember that in his baptism, Jesus was specially equipped by the Holy Spirit for his ministry. The Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus as he was baptized in the form of a dove. <clears throat> this prophecy in Joel is that there will come a time in what is referred to as the last days in which God will pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh, meaning all kinds of people, both young and old, male and female, both masters and servants. The result will be that they will see visions, dream dreams, and prophesy. And by prophesy, we mean speaking the word of the Lord or the message that God gives to them. In other words, all of God's people will be doing what the Old, Pro Old Testament prophets did. It's interesting here that Peter does not overly focus attention on the Holy Spirit. He's speaking of something bigger, something new and revolutionary that God is doing by the power of the Holy Spirit. The prophet Joel had said that this outpouring of the Spirit would happen in a time he refers to as the last days. And Peter points out that what is happening on Pentecost is a demonstration that the last days have arrived. Things have been set in motion and the world is changing. Now, you and I probably have many ideas about what last days mean, usually involving destruction, suffering, and the end of the world. But what did the last days mean for this audience, this group of Jews? We should note that for the Jews, history and time are linear, not cyclical. There was a beginning and there will be an end. The end of human history, however, is not really the end where everything is over, rather it's the consummation of God's good work and the arrival and the fulfillment of God's perfect kingdom. The Jews looked forward to the day of the Lord, as they called it, the day on which God would judge the nations and redeem and restore his people, the day on which God would make everything right, simply put. The last days, therefore, would be the period of time leading up to the day of the Lord. So a couple of things to note. First of all, the day of the Lord was considered a good thing for God's people. It was the time when God would set everything right, when justice and righteousness would prevail over sin, evil, and even death. It was something that God's people would hope for and indeed long for. So to hear that they are in the last days is actually supposed to be good and exciting news, not bad and scary news. Second, and significantly, the first Christians believed this. They believed that they were living in the last days. But you know what? You and I are still here. So what happened? I don't think that it means that they were wrong, and I don't think it means that we were left behind. The answer, I believe, is that God does not work on a fixed timeline. There's not a date set in stone for the day of the Lord that just keeps being delayed. Rather, the last days are the period in which God has set in motion 
the revolutionary movement of God's Spirit and God's people to prepare the world for the day of the Lord. In other words, we are still living in the last days. But our focus, you and I, should not be upon dates or timeline, but actually upon what God is doing in the world now. We generally consider that this passage is about the Holy Spirit. But if we listen closely to the story and to Peter's words, we'll notice something different. Peter doesn't stand up and talk to the people about the Spirit. He doesn't explain to them what the Spirit will do for them or invite them to come and experience the Spirit. Rather, Jesus uses this opportunity, I'm sorry, Peter uses this opportunity to speak to the people about Jesus, that Jesus suffered and died and rose from the dead. He's telling the gospel story that in his resurrection, Jesus proved that he was the promised king and savior, the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy, that God has made Jesus Lord of all, and anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord, that is the name of Jesus, shall be saved. It's the resurrection of Jesus that has actually started the revolution, that has begun the last days. It's Jesus who has received authority from God the Father. And it's Jesus who has poured out the Spirit of God upon his followers. It's all about Jesus. We as Christians never move beyond Jesus and what he has done for us. The revolution, the disruptive kingdom of God, the movement of God's Spirit, all this is revolutionary in that God is reconciling the world to himself through Jesus. That is the surprising revolutionary message of the gospel, that God is reconciling the world to himself through Jesus. And this message is revolutionary in that it is for all people. In Christ, there is no Jew or Greek, no male or female, no slave or free, no young or old. The story of the book of Acts is the story of this revolution unfolding. So let's remember that the story of Acts is not only the story of the early church. The book of Acts is also our story as followers of Jesus. The revolution that began with the resurrection of Jesus continues. It continues in our lives and in our life together as God's people, as the church. We are still living in the last days, and God has given us the continuing gift of his power and presence in the Holy Spirit. It's for us to experience this life-giving power of God and to realize that through us, this same life-giving power is available to the entire world. So let the story and the revolution continue. Blessings to you.